Welcome, Josh. How are you? I am okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all aggressively okay. <laughs> aggressively okay is, I think, yep, the right, the right answer here. It's just whatever. It's just yeah. <laughs> You've, uh, your family's been holding, holding up okay at home? Yeah, I mean, we've been doing as much as we can. You know, homeschooling kind of was an entire uh, loop for us, and so we're still not great. I'm a pretty okay writer and a pretty okay parent, but a pretty terrible teacher, as I've come to realize. And so trying to balance all these things all together. So my wife tends to take a lot of schooling, and I am like recess coordinator, and I find different adventures and try to make them somewhat educational every day. And so doing my best. No, I'm, I'm sure it's great. I was, I was actually, uh, I was wondering because Violet is such a, like, uh, a, as much of a staple in the brewing, in the beer community as, uh, as you are, I feel like at this point. <laughs> yeah, you know, Violet was born, uh, our daughter Violet, she's six, she'll be seven in the fall, and she kind of was born around the time that I think breweries really started taking off in New York City. The taproom laws changed, I think was at the end of like 2013-ish, and then everything from there. So it's pretty much locked up with our daughter being born. Everything started changing. I'd like to say that it was all our, all of our reasoning, but it was really the homebrewers that really kind of made everything happen. The laws changed combined with a very strong homebrewing scene in New York City really kind of um, for us at this point where we're at today. Yeah, I kind of got ahead of myself because it's just so nice to see familiar faces. It's so exciting to see. I wanted to give a brief, a very, very brief summary. Uh, if you do, again, if you do not know who Josh Bernstein is, how dare you? He has some of the best beer books uh, published, um, which are, oh, I had a list and I can't remember their name. I don't have their names right now. That's okay. Yeah, uh, Brewed Awakening, Complete Beer Course, Complete IPA, Homebrew World, and then uh, Drink Better Beer, which came out last fall. Exactly. There we go. I think one of the most comforting moments, we were in uh, in Europe last fall for Oktoberfest, and one of the most comforting moments was in the Bruges Beer Museum, seeing Homebrew World in the, uh, in the, what is it, the gift, the gift shop. It was very, very, like, heartwarming to see that, like, little taste of home. Yeah, it's pretty amazing to watch. You write a book, you're never really sure how things are going to echo out and how they're going to be responded to, and it's been pretty heartwarming to see I think Complete Beer Course has now been translated into, uh, I think it's in, there's a Chinese edition, Japanese edition, South Korean edition, other things too. And you don't really know when you're sitting there like up late at night uh, writing what's going to happen seven or eight years later. But it's been pretty crazy to watch that. And I've heard so many people that are like, you inspired me to get into beer. And I mean, oh. and that to me is really what makes it really worthwhile because it's words. Like I think words have the ability to inspire and that's what I've really tried to do over the years. That's so great. And besides your books, you've also, you also, uh, I guess it's freelancing, you uh, write for so many different newspapers, magazines, online publishing, uh, including New York Times, Bon Appetit, Men's Journal, uh, Savior, Wine Enthusiast, and Imbibe. Essentially, if you've written, if you anyone has read an article about beer or wine or travel or brewing or home brewing, it's probably by Josh Bernstein. You know, it's funny. I'm the guy that people forward my articles to their, their grandchildren, their children, their nephews, their nieces. I was in the park, uh, oh gosh, Mount Prospect Park, maybe about a week ago in Brooklyn. I ran to a brewer guy from, Fit, uh, from uh, Fifth Hammer. And then I guess his girlfriend's uh, mom was there. And then after I left, she walked up and she's like, oh my gosh, I forwarded your article in the Times to like, I was like, I'm that guy. It's like Josh Bernstein's are a dime a dozen, but I am the guy <laughs> that I guess articles forwarded, which is pretty hilarious. Oh, it's great. Love it. So because writing is- And also the, the founder of, oh, the founder of the homebrew chores. Yeah, of course. We're doing some mini virtual homebrew tours today. And Josh Bernstein is the man who got it all started and had the idea to uh, sell tickets to bring people to people's houses to drink their homemade beer. Yeah, and people did not think I was crazy. Yeah, I mean, this would have been, I think this is the 11th year. It was 09 that things started off on there too. And um, it's been pretty wild to watch that, what started off as a lark, you know, the idea of like bringing 25, 30 strangers in the homebrewers homes. I mean, it took a lot of convincing early on. And then, you know, we found a rhythm with it and people got into it. I mean, cause this, I think on a surface, pretty terrifying of opening up your apartment to 30 strangers, especially it even sounds ludicrous to talk about this in these times right now, because who have you let into your house? I mean, so I think nobody, but I mean, hopefully we'll be back at a day when, you know, we're willing to open our doors up again and we'll feel safe and comfortable and able to. And I think in the meantime, it's like it, 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 brewing, showing people how you can brew in small apartments has, I think, been inspiring to so many people as well, too. And just like the real estate porn, I mean, of like going to somebody's apartment and seeing what's in, what's in their kitchen, what's in their bathroom, all these other things as well. And it's just... Uh, 
it's pretty wild. I mean, you're in my kitchen, my, this is our bedroom right now, our plant bedroom. And so with all this stuff, and I think it provides, uh, I think homes provide a unique insight into people's worlds. I mean, this is sort of off topic for brewing, but our daughter's teacher came by for the first time to do like a drive by hello. And she's like, it's so amazing to see where our, uh, our, my students live. And it just helps you get a much more rounded understanding of their environments and who they are. Definitely. I definitely yeah. feel the real estate porn aspect of it when we were a, a stop on the on a tour with uh, Harry and P and Russell as well, and people were like poking in, looking at our bathroom, to asking us about the tile, trying to get into our bedroom. We're like, bit off off limits. Pretend there's yeah. a little bit rope here, please. Yeah, I had someone come up to me when I was serving beer at a homebrew event, and they drank, took a sip, looked at me, and said, "I've been in your house," <laughs> and I was like excuse me and they're like on the homebrew tour and I was like okay useful context but yes you have been in my house yeah I think to me I think they're one of my favorite things that we do and I really do hope that we're able to bring it back again um Sherry uh, was able to run tours for a few years now Brett uh, is Brett Vanderbrook is running tours now as well too and I mean it's just um once you set the ground rules is like you know don't die and don't drink too much and it's like everyone tends to be pretty uh pretty good and pretty we've never really had any problems in all the years of doing it which I mean it's testament to the fact of um there's a level of respect when you walk into people's homes definitely it is a very odd experience just essentially marching 30 strangers single file from your lobby into your apartment and just seeing how you can fit somehow 30 people into your home uh, it is a very surreal experience in there, in and out within an hour. <laughs> yeah, it made me a better, you know, like when we started this up, I was not a tour guide at all. I mean, that's not, it's not like I had like, tour, I took tour guide lessons or anything. I, but ever since I've been young, I've always been the guy that tried to bring people together and have ludicrous ideas, some successful, some not. Like I convinced a couple of friends to drive to Mongolia once back in like 07. And, you know, we, I just, we launched magazines, do all this stuff. And it's just, the idea is getting people excited enough that they just kind of go along with your, your follies and the follies become a reality and become something that have cherished memories about. That's so great. Um, so you said that, you know, you started these homebrew tours now uh, at least 11 years ago. Um, and your, so your first book came out over 10 years ago. How was it uh, trying to convince like a publishing company to write like just a book about beer? I feel like the, the scene in the world wasn't really as uh, into beer as it is now? Yeah, I mean, in two, in, in two things. So it was completely random how I got the first book deal. I worked for New York Press uh, for a number of years, which there was an alternative weekly, like a free newspaper in the vein of uh, Village Voice when it existed as well too. And I had a column where I went around the city and I just basically either drank too much, ate too much food, and had adventures in New York. And the publisher at Sterling Publishing was like on the subway one day and uh, picked up a copy of the New York Press and saw one of my columns about beer. And he was just like, oh, I should reach out to this guy about writing a book. Like literally wrote my editor, forwarded me the email, and then was like, why don't you write a book about stouts? And I was like, stouts? Yeah, why the heck not? Book's a book. And then essentially that became a, so that, so we changed the idea from writing a book about stouts is writing a book about what was happening in America and around the world from a journalism driven perspective. And that became Brood Awakening. And it was totally random that he found me and it was just kind of, but you know, it was 10 years of 10, it, it was random, but also 10 years, I think of hard work and writing that made that moment possible where I'd had this column in the paper and I'd been already been grinding for like, I think New York City for nine years, that moment in the journalism world. So, and so I got that book and then read, went into complete beer course, then on and on and on. And I mean, it's actually a lot harder nowadays to get people to care about beer books, I would say compared to them. Back in 2011, 2013, it felt novel to write about beer for a lot of people. And they're like, what's this all this beer? What's a micro brew? And they wanted to learn more about all that stuff. And nowadays, I think there is a, uh, you know, there's a glut of books out there and it's harder to kind of cut through the noise, even if you're trying to write stuff, it's good. I mean, that's just the reality. I mean, the same change with, you know, a brewery that came out in 2011 was like so unique and so different and you could just stand out by the sake of just purely existing and now you have to have something else to really stand out to people and I think that's the same way with um, book publishing that you've got to really continue to write excellent books get do excellent copy be really smart about how you present information in the world so that's really the it, it's a challenge I mean because you can't just like put out a book and they're like you did a book that's great like even my parents are like how many books did you write now they don't care <laughs> just like five books great Bernstein write another one and even my daughter comes up to me, she's like, you've only written five books, daddy. And I'm like, yeah, only five books, Violet. 
literally only five books. So, you know, I'm trying. We're going to be, um, I'm waiting for the contract. We're hopefully updating Complete Beer Course for next year. So that to kind of bring things up into modern times a little bit as well. So I think that's going to be the next uh, big project. Hopefully, we'll see. Great. That's awesome. Um, sorry, I just, uh, um, so how do you come up with the, the topics that you covered in your books? Um, is there, and is there another uh, topic for that's specifically that you want for a bu another book? I mean, five years ago, I wanted to write a book about the agrarian movement toward beer and how that was echoing out everything from Farber said breweries to maltsters and onward, but that did not happen. I think, I think the problem is sometimes things get a little bit too niche that we're in this beer world and we think about that all these things are so second nature to everybody, but most people don't know the difference between ales and lagers still. And that means there's a big educational chasm that we have to go. So when you start diving down and thinking about all these little minute subjects you want to write about, I'll be real, most people don't care. I mean, most people just want to have fun at 5 p.m. And that's the reality. So you've got to find a way to make it all engaging. I think that's been the eternal struggle for no matter if I'm writing books, articles, is understanding that you know, I like beer, I love beer, all these things about beer, but other people don't like it in the same way. They don't care about the hot bill. They don't care about, you know, oxidation. They don't care about anything like that. And so how do you make something that is just something that was second nature to you? You know, how do you make it exciting? And I think that, I think we're in a moment right now where people care a bit more. Nobody cared about fermentation and bread and things like that. So you're seeing people with the time when the world is paused, being able to kind of unpack these things that, never really ask questions about like most people you, you bought bread you didn't think about bread and now people are like oh i've got my yeast i've got my sourdough starter i've got all this and that and people care a bit more than they used to about these sort of um things so i'm hoping right now if something good can come out of this it's just that we care a bit more about the manufacturing supply chains how things fit together and that you know beer to your be, seeing beer in a shelf is you know it's it, it doesn't just appear magically there's an entire chain of people that go out there i think when you're younger, you go to a bar, you're just like, beer, great. Here, I will buy a beer. There is $3, that makes me happy. You don't ask yourself any more questions, but I think right now people care a bit more. But I mean, so I think Complete Beer Course will be the next big book, but as far as other stories right now, I think the one I wanna dive into is really um, figuring out virtual beer festivals, what that's looking like. Great American Beer Festival was just canceled a couple of days ago. Untapped is selling tickets to virtual beer festivals. Um, we're on a virtual thing right now. I don't know what's, but you know, it's like, is that, is it emotionally satisfying to drink alone staring at a screen with people or not? I mean, that's going to be the big question. I mean, we've had this fizzy moment where Zoom is really exciting. Now it's become like any other device. It's just become utility. It went from being exciting to becoming a utilitarian device. And so it happened pretty quickly because it's hard to replace human nature. So I really want to dive into what does a beer festival look like when, you know, when somebody is not cheering, when, you know, we hate it when people drop a glass and somebody cheers and the stupid pretzel necklaces. I bet you'd love to see somebody kind of like tipsily walking down the road, like, uh, <laughs> you know, with a pretzel necklace on half nod. I know it's like the thing <laughs> that we want to see now. So I think that's one story I want to dive into right now. Sort of the next like big idea I have. I mean, that, and also I'm going to be doing a big cover story from Bob for September, really I'm sketching that out right now, talking about what all this looks like, you know, going forward, how do we come out of this? What happens, like what happens when, you know, I've talked to beer distributors, like some of them are having a hard time getting beer because people are selling all of their beer direct to consumers nowadays. So what happens, it's just like so many disruptions are happening so rapidly. And, you know, people that pivoted to go to canning immediately and just, you know, I'm interviewing Boneyard Brewing in Oregon and Bend, which was Oregon's largest draft only brewery, then had to change the dime to become like a canning focused brewery. And what does it look like coming out of this? Now that you've given people a taste of this world, do you go back? And I mean, the alcohol laws to go, so many things, it just feels like right now there's a lot of open possibility for how things can really um, change, I think at the moment too. I mean, I bought to go margarita yesterday and it was pretty awesome. You know, then I went to Copenhagen to drop up some beers and I like, I'm like, I just dump out my ice and get this filled with some beer and go walk. And they're like, sure thing, Josh. And you know, you pay your money and you walk down the road. It's, a, it, it, it was like this European sensibility pervading, I think a lot of what's happening, especially in New York City, that this like beer, alcohol consumption, there's a destigmatization happening about how it's being accepted in polite society. And the absence of bars, the parks, the parks have always kind of been our undercover bar things like that. And now they're becoming a much more overtly um, bar-like experience. 
and enabled by bars as well too. Right. Yeah, uh, taking a walk down to uh, the little grocer yesterday was it, the vibe on uh, the sidewalks because everyone, every restaurant that was, if they didn't uh, pivot to selling like grocery goods, like, you know, to be a market, they're just selling drinks out of their window. And it's like, this is such a cool vibe. If it wasn't, you know, kind of tainted with everyone wearing masks and gloves. And it's just this very weird juxtaposition of like, oh, this is fun. There's music lasting from this place and this area, like, cause they're selling their, their drinks, but everyone's very skittish around everyone else. And yeah. Very covered yeah. Up. And on the flip side, I know that it's caused some trouble for bars because people will get their to-go drinks and then stand directly outside the bars in clusters and everyone takes their masks off and drinks their drinks and the cops are coming by and issuing citations for the people, which is like 25 bucks, but also don't be an idiot. Uh, but then also like some of the bars are getting huge fines for serving people uh, who are drinking it directly outside the bar. So I feel like a lot of bars are now having to like beg people, please don't stand directly outside the bar and drink this drink I've just given you, take it somewhere else. Like if you're not gonna go home, go to the park. Yeah, I mean, humans are gonna human. I mean, <laughs> yeah. that's just the reality. It's unfortunate that we tend to, you know, I think it's, um, there's definitely gonna be growing pains with this too. And I think the lack of bathrooms, there's like nowhere to pee anymore. You know, even if you go outside and go for a walk, it's like, you can't pop in the coffee shop and be like, oh, I gotta go. You know, if you get a coffee, you have like an automatic, like your bladder time limit starts ticking, you know, <laughs> once you get a coffee or if you get a beer. And I mean, it's like all these things. So there's just, nothing is per, it's the imperfect answers to an imperfect world at the moment, but you know, it. I think we all look forward to tiny things that can make us happy during the day. And if we can find a little bit of something on that too, getting cocktails delivered from a bar, getting your brewery coming directly to your door, something like that. I mean, we're looking for kind of little, little joys in the world. And that these little joy, these little tiny things can give you joy. I mean, that's, that's what matters right now. Cause I mean, taken on the surface, it's pretty freaking depressing what's happening. You know, people unemployed, like work collapsing, everything all together. You know, beer has always had the ability to be transportative and give you a little bit of happiness and bring people together. And I think that's what people are craving right now too. And just the democratization of the uh, beer drinking experience that we're, nobody's drinking at a cultish brewery anymore. Nobody's traveling to three hours. We're all drinking these beers. But what's cool is these breweries are coming to us now in a way that they never have been before. Cause once you eliminate the cultishness once you eliminate the ability to, you know, wait in line for a beer and bring it back home, it's like the next thing is you kind of have to pivot. You know, other half delivering to your door, Trillium selling out every morning and delivering across Massachusetts. It's just like, it's crazy stuff. It's like, you know, these, they're coming, they're, there's the same level of excitement's happening, but you don't have to basically, you don't have to spend half your day waiting to acquire these experiences in this liquid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, we are getting ready to bring in our next guest, but real quick, one last question. Yes. Uh, we realized like we did not know. You've been a fixture of the beer and the homebrew world in New York for so long, but we realized we didn't know. Have you ever homebrewed yourself? Not really. <laughs> it's kind of hilarious. <laughs> I mean, that's like, I've worked, I've brewed with people before, all that stuff, but it, it's funny. I always talk to people. It's a very, it's a very specific question that comes to people that like nobody asks a bourbon writer if they've ever kind of like cranked up a still, but because home brewing is so easy for a lot of, you know, easy is not the right word, but it's so accessible to so many people in so many kitchens. But, you know, I've always approached things from like an event organization, supportive, like ground, ground root supportive and just kind of like um, journalistic focused perspective on things on that too. And that's, I think, and that's what's great with the beer world. There's like roles for everybody within it as well. I mean, I think when homebrewing started taking off in New York City, I mean, I was already writing about beer and not doing so much. And then, I don't know, maybe I should write. I got time, right? I mean, now's the time. Bitter and Esters is delivering. They are delivering. I've been making tapache and things like that. So simpler right. ferments. Right. But I wanted to cook in the house. And it's hard. I've been cooking three freaking meals a day for two and a half months. And I'm like, I'm a little tired. A lot. <laughs> Kill you. <laughs> I have no idea. But yes. Uh, Brewing people, but you know, it's always been my role to just, I don't know, be the supporter, be the person that brings it all together, I guess. And so, right. I don't know. Love it. We love you. We miss you a lot. We miss seeing you out and about. Walk by the house, a wave on the stoop. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks so much, everybody. And uh, good luck the rest of the day today. Only how many hours left? Uh, we have, oof, I'm bad at.
math. 22 and a half? 22 and a half. <laughs> Good. Oh, yeah. I'm glad I'm here at the beginning, the excitement instead of the four a.m. <laughs> Delirious. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Cheers, everybody. Good luck with the rest of the day. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take Bye. Care. Okay, there we go. Uh, okay, so we have our, thank you again, Josh Bernstein. It was, again, so nice to see. Uh, hey. <laughs> um, hold on, hold on. Uh, uh, right, how do I do this? Hold on, cannot figure out what to do here. Well, so Rachel's working on bringing in our next guest for whom I have a prop. Oh, um, I did, so I wanted to bring this out for Josh Bernstein because I, I got uh, this oh. <laughs> event. I had it literally right next to me and totally forgot. Oh, well. Um, so our next guest is uh, Mary Azette, who is also a big name in the homebrew community and co-owner of Fifth Hammer Brewing and the author of Speed Brewing. Um, we're also going to bring in Pia, who is going to do a speed speed brewing recipe while we interview Mary. Thanks for reminding me about that. <laughs> okay, they have been promoted and you will have to turn your video on yourselves. <gasps> Yay, Pia! Good match. Yay, Mary! Hello! Hey, How Mary. are you both? Here, I, I don't copy of Speed Brewing while Mary is unmuted. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, ours, ours is on the bookshelf. <laughs> uh, rose, you can't see it, the rose cardamom soda today. Yeah, we figured we'd be super cute and fancy like uh, those uh, cooking shows where we have our, the host, the guests, and uh, someone uh, doing the, 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 the thing we're talking about as it's happening. So. I think all the labels are backwards, so sorry. <laughs> oh, no, it's good. It's, it's mirrored for us. Don't worry. <laughs> so um, just really quick, and then I'll mute myself. I've been steeping three cardamom pods in half a cup of water just off the boil. I'm going to pour in a cup and a half of sugar. Um, and then I'll come back at the end, and we'll almost be done. <laughs> so, um, we'll see how it goes. First of all, Mary, what an amazing background you have of all of your spices. I yeah. am so jealous of this space. <laughs> yeah, my kitchen. So, part, I mean, some of this is started, I guess I started spice collecting when I was writing the book, but now, um, actually I started cooking a lot in December. And then of course, like most of us, I'm cooking, you know, all the time right now. So, or, you know, all, all, pretty much all of our meals. We've been, I've been eating, getting a little bit of outside food when I'm at the brewery, so lately just to support some of our local LIC businesses but otherwise yeah I cook a lot and I love spices and flavors I know we lost Pia no, I think she turned her video off oh, okay um okay so how did you find your way to fermentation and is there a beer that got you into it um how did I find my way into fermentation well I started drinking craft beer when I was in college which was a long time ago um, when there was not very much selection. I was in college at the University of Georgia and I was drinking, what was I drinking back then? Um, Abita was available. There were a couple, like this was in the 90s. So not so much of a selection as nowadays. Um, and then I got really into, you know, I just was drinking as more craft breweries popped up. I drank, you know, explored the world of craft beer more. I moved to New York City in 2003 um, and, um, kind of continued with my love of craft beer and um I would go to beer craft a lot and Ben Granger who is now at other half uh was always like why don't you brew and so I started brewing in 2006 um and that went I I started brewing in January 2006 um the New York City Homebrewers Guild gave the first BJCP classes in starting I think in February or March uh, for the first time in like eight years that they had been done in New York City and um so I fell down the rabbit hole really quickly and, and yep, it's, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, what attracted you to focus on speed brewing? So I um, got really into brewing sours for a while. So I had a, a, I was living in South Park Slope in an apartment that had, it was a, 
It was actually a decent sized apartment for one person. It was like 600 square feet or something. But I had a shared backyard and a shared basement. And my neighbors were super cool. It was a small building. There was, you know, three floors, three apartments. And um, so I got really into sours. This was around, I don't know, like maybe 2004 to 2005 area, maybe. Um, and I had all these traditional sours. So I would take drags from like Cantillon or, you know, whatever. And, and kind of build up these wild culture starters. And so I had, at some point I had like 24 fermentation vessels in my basement full of beer. Um, and a lot of them were sour. I mean, ranging from like, I was doing like kombucha scoby beer experiments at that point. So, you know, ranging from like one gallon to five gallons. But at that point it was a lot. Um, and so um, I happened around the same time to go to a sheep and wool festival. I also knit and weave and sew and stuff. Um, so I went to a sheep and wool festival with some of my friends and, you know, we like kind of go our separate ways and everybody, you, you can buy yarn, sheep, all kinds of stuff at the sheep and wool, at sheep and wool festivals. <laughs> so at the end of the day, you know, we all come together and look at what everybody um, um, got. And one of my friends had, had bought this short mead kit and I was like, what is short mead? And I knew what mead was from the New York City Homebrewer Guild meeting. Their annual May meeting is always mead focused, but I'd never heard of short mead. So she made it and like two weeks later, I went over to her apartment and tried some and it was delicious. It was this effervescent, I think hers was, the first one she did was like an elderflower. Um, it was effervescent, low alcohol, just super delicious. And I was like, wow, you made that in like a week and a half. That's crazy. So uh, that's kind of those, it was those two things, like having all this sour beer fermenting, you know, long-term fermenting in my basement. And then, you know, and me kind of being like, I can't brew beer. Like I need to wait until some of this is, is done. Um, and then having this, this short mead. So um, basically I made my own short mead and I actually did find those kits at a homebrew store in Pennsylvania at some point, cause I wanted to try them. Um, and that's, that's what inspired it. But I started bringing these short meads to places like parties and sharing them with people obviously homebrew clubs and everybody you know it's kind of like a mind-blowing moment like wait you made this in a week and a half and it's really good and it's you know low alcohol it's refreshing it's you can you know super creative and very easy and that was one of the things when I was um president of the New York City Homebrewers Guild a lot of people would be like oh man I want to start homebrewing but I don't have enough room or I work two jobs or I have three roommates or whatever reason I'm like no you you can brew like period and this was probably around the same time that Brooklyn Brew Shop started their one gallon kits was which which was pretty revolutionary at the time as well so I think you know that was a time like hey you don't need to brew five gallons you can brew one gallon you don't have to brew beer you can make short mead or cider or some other sugar-based beverage. I had a spinach wine going at one point. You know, you could make that in one ga half gallons. You could do tiny, tiny amounts of this and, and do very fast fermentations that take very little effort and turn out beautifully. And there's nothing like them commercially available, which is cool too. So that was kind of what led me down that road. I got really loud about it. I did a seminar at the, at the National Homebrewers Conference on, it was called fermenting on the flip side. And it was like kind of these, some of these alternative fermentations. Um, I met Drew Beecham. I had met Drew Beecham at the, at one of the national homebrew conference or homebrew con as it's known now. And, um, and so he hooked me up with his editor and, and that's how the book came about. So cool. Um, you were mentioning the, the crafts and sheep and wool festival. <laughs> um, how have you managed to tie together your, uh, crafting hobbies and your beer, uh, yeah professional life yeah not so much I actually just so this brewery we open so I also co-own Fifth Hammer Brewing Company with my husband Chris Kuzmi and our partners Dave and Eleni ah uh, yes the swerve glass um my so most used glass I think we um we opened in fall of 2017 is that right oh my god where are we 2020 yeah and I was still working full-time at the time that we opened so working a full-time job as well as at the brewery and I quit my day job and went full-time with Fifth Hammer in June of 2018. Um, but I kind of didn't do any, like we just focused on the brewery for the first couple years. So I really, like, I didn't, you know, we didn't cook. I lived out, you know, I lived off cold pizza leftover that was in the cold room, you know? I mean, yeah, it was a crazy time for a while. But, um, but I think I've just now gotten back to more of that stuff. I've been sewing face masks, so, you know, I had to like, I forgot how to thread my machine. Um, but I think, you know, this has been a good time, even though I'm working full time now because I'm running the beer counter at Fifth Hammer Beer Counter, as I like to affectionately call it. Um, <laughs> you know, I am working full time, not in the house. And so, um, 
but I have had some time to do things. Anyway, so I haven't, I was doing like, I did some mending nights at the brewery. I did some other kind of creative stuff, but otherwise I think I've been, I've turned that creative energy into like taking photos for Instagram and, and that kind of stuff. So I don't know. I haven't tied it so much, but, but they definitely like still parallel. Yeah. I I had seen the, I'd seen the, like the fiber, what was it? Fiber faction. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Uh, I didn't. I didn't get a chance to make it to one in the before times. Yeah. We'll see what happens in the after times. <laughs> Maybe not this year, but at some point we'll be able to gather. You know. I like that this is just a void. That there's the before times, and there'll eventually be the after times, and this is just a non-time. <laughs> yeah. time. Now we're, just, we're here in the now. Yeah. <laughs> um. So I saw you guys are. You just started doing uh, Fifth Hammer after hours on Instagram. Can you tell us a little bit about that and where that idea came from? So I've seen, you know, one of the things when we, when we first went into this, well, obviously New York City shut down, you know, they announced on March 15th, I believe, that all bars and restaurants were going to shut down. We kind of knew that was happening because we had gone to half capacity that weekend. So at that point, we said, actually, Kuzme was out of the country unavailable. He was on a sailboat in the Atlantic Ocean, not available via communication. Our partner, Dave, and his wife was also in the Caribbean. Um, and our taste tap room manager was um, also out of state. So anyway, I was here. So at that point, we, on Monday, we just went straight to a to-go room, basically. Um, and I had our online store up within, I don't know, 24, 48 hours, something like that. And we basically pivoted to a beer store um, very fast, which was great. You know, I went to contactless pay. We went to, you know, all whatever, all these things we put into place. And it's continuing to change. Like, I'm still... You know, we're all, I think all of us that are open right now are continuing to adapt and make things better for both us and our customers um, and just make things smoother and the best that we possibly can. So I've learned a ton throughout this entire thing. And now I can't remember what the original question was. Instagram Live, yeah. So I think at the, the beginning, you know, I mean, I run our Instagram and I think none of, like, I didn't know what to do. Like, we want people to stay at home, but we want you to come and buy our beer and then take it home and drink it. And, you know, um, but now here we are. Um, and we are, uh, I think, you know, we still want people to stay at home, definitely social distance. I will say we do require masks and pretty much everybody in New York city is wearing them. Um, which is pretty cool. At least everybody that comes to the brewery, uh, and everybody that, that I pass from, you know, between Williamsburg and Long Island city. Um, but, um, we're not, so breweries are phase three of reopening. New York City has not been cleared. So we will be July at the earliest and it's, we're definitely not going to be at capacity. So we don't know what that's going to look like. Um, so we're in this to go, you know, we're still, we're a beer counter for now. Um, and um, anyway, so, but part, so we don't have our regular, we miss our community. We miss everybody that comes to the tap room. So one way that we thought, you know, that we could kind of connect with people again is doing this Instagram live. So it's kind of meant to be you know, a hybrid, somewhat of a school, like we're trying to pick a theme and, and make it educational, but also make it maybe fun too. So I don't know. That's kind of where it came from. We, we need outlets, Kuzmi and I, so we miss everybody. I mean, it's great. We can see, you know, I'm still helping at, you know, I help serve. So we do get to see, you know, I get to see a lot of people through our job, even if we're masked and gloved, that's fine. Um, but uh, yeah, we miss everybody. So yeah, I think actually a lot of us, uh, the last event that we were at all together was, for beer week at oh, yeah, the the was that did there, which is an odd thing to think about yep and omega so they actually closed down for a little bit Ooh, um, feared us and they are back so we are ordering so we actually returned to full brewing capacity so we stopped brewing for a while we brewed one beer in that week that new york city shut down before new york shut down we brewed actually a brett table beer so it's fine you know we knew that was going to be fine to hang out in the tanks for however long it needed to um and then we brought our brewers back a couple weeks ago. Chris has just been taking care of the beer. We have been canning, meanwhile, in this time. But we have gone, we're back at full-scale production. Um, obviously, our oh, business wow. model is different now. We're canning. Um, we've been canning. We're canning on, like, every week or every other week. We just ordered a canning line. Uh, so that will hopefully be here, like, mid to late June. So, you know, we, we've definitely changed not only, like, our on-premise situation, but really our, our business model completely. Um, obviously, we're not alone. I think that's what is most of us are doing. Um, and it's very awesome that we can do that um, and do it pretty quickly. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we're full-scale production. We are getting yeast from Omega, including Kavike yeast, and uh, it's awesome. So. Yeah, thank goodness Omega came back. And yeah. I, I, 
wondering about that because uh, because I know a lot of New York City breweries rely on the mobile canning companies that yeah. come around. It's like, are they having them come by? Are they like, yeah. having to purchase their own canning systems now? So. No, I mean, awesome. Honestly, so we use Ironheart, but we also are familiar with Maltman, and a lot of breweries in New York City um, are using Maltman right now. Those are the only two that I know about in, since this has all happened, but um, but Ironheart has been amazing. Like, they have been, I mean, we've been with them since the since we opened, pretty much. So we've been long-time clients, but they've been super great about, you know, being adaptable to the dates that we need. We did have, so uh, I don't know how many of you have been reading about the CO2 shortage, but uh, we have had some CO2 issues. We actually, the whole, oh, see, the CO2 industry is super weird, especially in New York City. But I, I think from what I read online, it's like that everywhere. So we kind of have to order, I mean, they should monitor us theoretically, but we sometimes have to order top offs and um, our CO2 company has really screwed us I'll be blatantly honest they are horrible I will not name their names but they're horrible and uh, we actually ran out of CO2 through when we were canning and Ironheart was able to you know come back like a few days later when we were able to get to so Ironheart has been absolutely amazing and I've heard the same thing about Maltman but the truth is look if we're going to be canning every week or if we need to be able to can sometimes more than once a week right then we need our own canning line so yeah we ordered a canning line. I have a, a semi-selfish question yeah. um are you going to be uh, doing any delivery or shipping to uh, us in Brooklyn or like Southern, Southern Brooklyn who don't have a car? <laughs> yes, so we are shipping now. Um, so part of the, the issue is that, so when we went into this, like most breweries, we came into this. So we are draft driven or we have been draft driven in the past. Like we have a tap room with 16 drafts. We sell kegs outside. I mean, obviously we are canning and we sell kegs I mean, we sell cans from our tap room as well as wholesale, but really we were putting the majority of beer into draft. Um, now, luckily we're in a very populated neighborhood. So we were able to, you know, when we started, we were just doing crawler fills. Uh, I added to go cups um, cause it is the wild west of sidewalk drinking right here in New York city. Um, although people must not congregate. Um, so if you're out there drinking in New York city, don't freaking congregate. Like, yeah. We have, we have been visited by very polite officials um, and they don't care that you're drinking outside, but they care that you are drinking outside and not social distancing. So don't social distance when you drink, don't group up, you know, hang out somewhere that nobody else is. Um, anyway, um, that's like some, I had to make a bunch of new signs yesterday and, you know, we're drawing sidewalk chalk. It's great. It's just people, you know, and also if you're going to pick stuff up, like we're, we all need a little direction, right? That's why grocery stores have put in like one way aisles with big arrows on the floor. We all, you know, everybody want, I think most people want to do the right thing. We just want somebody to tell us how to do it because it's, you know. And I, yeah. and I think that a lot of people know that, you know, getting a personal citation for drinking outside is not a big deal for the like individual person. Um, but I think that some people don't realize that it can have like repercussions for the place that sold you the alcohol and don't want their favorite bars and breweries and restaurants to be getting in trouble. And also, look, I think that we, you know, we can kind of, we can have some safe, fun times in the sunshine. Um, but we, everybody needs to be very responsible and it will continue. I think that's my take on this from our experiences thus far. Anyway, um, so now I can't remember your question again, cause I keep rambling. Um, was it about deliveries and you answered oh, yeah. so we started shipping. So the problem with this, okay, so we were, then there was a nationwide crowd shortage. We went to 60 ounce beers that we canned with an October machine. And we're still doing that as well as to go cups. But you know, we're, we're moving towards canning more. It's just that we had to up production again. I mean, Kuzmin was brewing by himself out over there, which was great, but, but you know, it's a, now we're doing a catch up game, right? All of our tanks are full. We've got to get those beers in a can so that we th then can like ship and deliver. We are planning home delivery. Um, we wanted to launch it like two weeks ago. But we just don't have enough beer. So, you know, we're canning, I believe three or four beers this next week. We're canning the next week again. I mean, we have canning dates like we're going to be fully stocked very shortly. We're also canning full 30 barrel batches. Um, so we're going to be fully stocked with beer. And at that point we can launch like full scale shipping, home delivery, everything we have started. We, we cut off wholesale sales, um, for a while. Cause we just didn't have enough beer that, you know, made sense. Most bars aren't doing kegs are not buying kegs. So, um, so yeah, all of that is, is coming. And I think, you know, those are those that home delivery and, and home sh shipping within New York state is all provisional right now, but they keep extending that as, you know, as our pause gets extended. And there are some, you know, there are some bills that will, that are now, have now been um, 
are being proposed that will allow us to do that for much longer than this situation. Because that really, that's key. I mean, bars and restaurants are gonna, even, when we go to half capacity, that's not sustainable for most of us, especially bars and restaurants. Like they need to continue to be able to deliver and, and sell directly to consumers. Yeah. Anyway. I will say that uh, I'm watching George on past the computer furiously order beers right now from you. <laughs> so you heard well, that. We're almost out of IPA and four packs, but we have more coming. So we'll have like a much greater selection um, <laughs> in the next, yeah. It's been a long quarantine without Biff Hammer. <laughs> That's very true. We have five loggers, which is pretty awesome, so. Loggers forever. Yes, loggers <laughs> life, man. Okay, I think what we're gonna do now is, uh, oh, uh, oh. Check in with you. Oh, perfect. Oh, where'd you go? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, how's it going? All right. So I started with sugar, which is pretty much what happened. You guys love me. <laughs> so um, this has cooled a bit, maybe not enough for me to get to pitch my yeast, but I'm pouring it in to, I'll show you. Um, so one and a half gallons of fermented that I have. So that's one and a half cups of sugar. Three caramel pods. Um, this is about two and a half ounces of rose syrup. I thought I had rose water. Cool. Today, so I guess something that happens here. I think that you're. Um, I'm going to let this spill out a little bit more, but once it's around like 75, 70, I'm going to pitch this Nottingham yeast. Cool. And then we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, Mary, I think you had in your book champagne yeast that you mentioned that using an English ale would maybe give you a bit of a fruitier, like esterier profile. Yeah. So I thought that would be fun to try it out here. I mean, I like it's just like the workhorse because, you know, it's extremely pH tolerant. It's extremely temperature tolerant. Mm -hmm. You know, it's super good. One thing I did, speaking of Omega and Kavike yeast, because we, you, you know, we, well, I love Kavike yeast. I mean, I've never actually home brewed with it, but we brew with it a lot at the Hammer. Um, and that's one thing that I've been wanting to do. I just haven't had time. Although maybe now this week is the time. I have like midweek is my time off because, uh, we're busiest on the weekend, so I work. I'm I'm managing this beer counter, so I work all weekend long. Um, anyway, but maybe I will head down to Bitter and Esther's and, and see. I don't know if they have, to, but also I think we just ordered a pitch of Kavaiki, so I could get some from the brewery. But I'd like to do a lot of these of the speed brewing beverages like that beverage with Kavaiki. So I think it would work great. I mean, it's super temperature tolerant. It doesn't, you know, it's phenolic negative, so it ferments very clean. So I think it would work pr pretty well. So. Yeah, yeah. If I had sung it. Put on my list to do. <laughs> also, I have to say, it smells amazing. Awesome. The cardamom plus the rose water, just like, I think you mentioned it, it's sort of like an Indian dessert, and it really smells like yeah. that. It smells like so floral and beautiful and rich. So I'm excited to try it. It's awesome. <laughs> amazing. Well, thank you, Pia, for doing this demonstration. Uh, I love this. It was such a fun little uh, idea that you had. It was so great. <laughs> And thank you so much, Mary, for joining us uh, for you, Mary. in the morning. We really appreciate it uh, for being a part of this. You're such a huge, uh, you, I don't think, I don't know, figurehead. We, everyone looks up to you in the home brewing and beer community. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Good luck with the rest of the day. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, bye, bye guys. Okay, so uh, move people back to attendee. <laughs> oh, wow. um, yes, bringing people back. Yay. All right, bringing some brewers back. Thanks so much to Josh and to Mary for joining us. Um, so we're going to check in on our brewers, and then right after that, we're going to do some. Uh, Oh, what did Pia do? Pia made a one of Mary's speed ferments from her book, mm -hmm. Speed Brewing. Um, so it's a ton of recipes for all different styles of beverages. There's beers, there's meads, kombuchas, um, boozy sodas um, that you can make in real quick timelines. So it's like beers that ferment in four to five days, um, stuff that ferments in two days. So it's a great, uh, great tool for stuff that you don't have to wait a really long time. Pia was making a rose and cardamom soda. Um, so you can see she made, got it all prepped in the course of a uh, 20 minute interview. So they're real quick to get going and quick to ferment too. Let me stop the recording. Um, so we're going to go to